It's 1980, and you're probably getting real excited to see those new movies coming out. You know you were bugging your older brother to take you to see this one. At first, no one believed it. No, no one will forget it. Alligator. Or maybe you just got done with work and you want to sit down, crack open a Coca-Cola, and watch your favorite show. Monday on MASH, Hawkeye decides to charge for his services and he's willing to take almost anything. Chicken! <laughs> or maybe, just maybe, you were waiting around for the new heavy music to drop. So if that's you, you've come to the right place. Because today, we're going to be talking about the top 10 heavy metal records of the year 1980. I figure before we jumped in this list, I just kind of explain how I put it together and going forward how we're going to be doing 1981 to 1989. They're all going to follow the same suit. So it's going to be a top 10 essential list, not a ranking of number 10 being worst and number one being best. It's just an essential list. Also, some of the albums you've probably seen on other lists and you might say this is a little redundant. I've seen these kind of lists before. But I promise I'm going to cover all sorts of different genres of metal and hopefully I get into some stuff you don't always see on all these kind of lists and maybe some stuff you've never heard before or you're not as familiar with. So stick around because 1980 is now. Angel Witch self-titled is their first album originally released on bronze records it features an oil painting from 1841 by english romantic painter engraver and illustrator john martin titled fallen angels in hell or the fallen angels entering pandemonium now with a heavy black sabbath led zeppelin and deep purple influence and the guitar work to prove it this is a shredder Kevin Hayborn's guitar mastery along with his fantastic higher pitched and melodic vocals just add to the overall greatness of this record. Hayborn's love of fantasy and horror is evident in the lyrics along with the atmosphere and the overall vibe. It could be argued that this had an eventual influence even on black metal. This is a staple of the beginning of the NWO BHM movement. Songs like Angel Witch showcase Kevin's speed, but for my money, you just can't beat the song Angel of Death. And not the Slayer, this is a totally different song. This three-piece freshman album crams in some of the best metal you will ever hear, just period. This album also really helped shape the thrash metal movement in the mid 80s and it's just an essential record overall if you're just a lover of all metal this is just right up there the title track was featured in the video game brutal legend starring jack black and this is just like i said this is a must have it's had about four different pressings with bonus tracks and demos and different things but if you want to just get the vinyl for this you're looking at about minimum $30 for it, and even still, it's a very difficult record to find on vinyl, if you can. Saxon's second album, Wheels of Steel, starts right off ripping with awesomely strong vocals and plenty of leads and sing-along choruses this album really feels fresh even now yet another fixture of the nwo bhm movement saxon really cemented themselves with this one it's fast it's catchy and it's got a lot of strong guitar work this album has a really raw buzzsaw sound with plenty of melody you can definitely hear the influence this has had on the likes of Motley Crue, Dokken, and really even Metallica. Street Fighting Gang sounds like a song Motley Crue would have made had it not been Saxon. 
it has tons of riffs with a lot of that post 70s sound with metal taking the reins this album went platinum in the uk and several songs were featured in gta games along with the motorcycle man being in brutal legend remaster editions exist with demos and live versions on them but as far as the vinyl goes it's about a ten dollar starting point if you want to pick that one up you definitely want to pick this thing up it's a great great album Which Finds Give em Hell is the debut album from yet another player in the new wave of British heavy metal. The vocals fit right in with the other prior albums I mentioned, being quite melodic. This album also had a huge influence on the later black metal movement. It has a 70s sound coming from influences like Black Sabbath, Judas Priest, Thin Lizzy, along with touches of psychedelic rock. It has mostly mid-paced songs with more of a fun spin on Satanism and the occult. This definitely has like an eerie sound throughout the record. There's a lo-fi sound that is all over this thing, further giving this that culty vibe. The music isn't black metal, but you can sense the shape of things to come. You really need to check this one out with an open mind if you're used to a faster form of metal. It's bluesy gloomy, doomy, and you definitely got to pick this one up. It has a reissue with three bonus tracks, and if you're looking to pick this one up on vinyl, you're going to probably start start off around anywhere from about $25 to Here is yet again another NWO BHM album and this one is got somebody that needs no introduction, Bruce Dickinson. This would be his first album that he would be on vocals and they are just absolutely fantastic. Uh, Head On has some killer guitar riffs and licks. The drums are really exceptional as well. The drummer, Thunderstick, he spent a brief moment in Iron Maiden, and if you listen, you can hear the rendition of Ides of March off of the Killers album on here. There's plenty of that 70s rock, but with a nice little metal kick to it. This, yet again, is a great album from that NWO BHM movement, but I swear to God, I do have U.S. metal on this list. Um... The production on this album is really decent and it showcases the melodic riffs along with that snappy bass that's on this too. Bruce hits his notes and delivers some real nasty grittiness at times and the cover art is definitely a precursor to that leather and studs look that others such as Judas Priest eventually adopted. I'd just like to say rest in peace to Paul Sampson, but thanks for this killer album. Now, if you're going to pick this one up on vinyl, you're going to probably spend starting around $50, and it's pretty rare in the U.S. being a U.K. import. Ace of Spades, Motorhead's fourth album, and the first that was released in the United States. What else can I say about this album that hasn't already been said about this classic thing? Not only does this deserve to be on this list, but I could easily throw this on a best albums of all time list. This album feels like a greatest hits album. It's that good. It went gold in the UK and for good reason. Lemmy's vocals and bass, Facity Clark's awesome guitar work, and Phil Filthy Animal Taylor's blistering drums round this thing out to perfection. Though the band considers themselves rock and roll, this has that punk spirit and the speed of thrash metal, which also huge influences on both of those genres for generations to come. Ace of Spades is as good as any song as an opener, but it doesn't stop there. Love Me Like a Reptile, Shoot You in the Back, Fast and Loose, etc, etc, etc. This album is timeless. With special editions on both CD and LP, this is an easy to find album, and it should be because everyone should own it. I love every song on this. It's a perfect album. 
and you can look to pay about twenty dollars for a nice 180 gram vinyl edition of this and they have some really awesome giant box set ones too that you can get but you definitely need to own this thing <laughs> Let me tell you something. Where are you from? Greece is the best, man. <laughs> Greece is the best. I'm telling you. Hey, let me tell you. Robert Halford is the best motherfucking single around. They can't get down it, man. The motherfucker can play some guitar. British Steel is the sixth album by Judas Priest. Rob Halford has stated being on tour with ACDC in 79 really influenced their sound on this album. It's not their most complex album, but it's possibly one of their best. Rapid Fire sets the stage with the pre-thrash sound, and K.K. Downing and Glenn Tipton don't disappoint with every song from Grinder to United. This is a staple of every Metalhead's collection and is definitely for me one of the first albums I heard that pushed my love for metal. Rob Halford hits his notes but also has some really great catchy chorus sing-alongs. This is another album where what else can be said that hasn't been said about it already. Its impact is huge on the metal genre including the amount of musicians who have stated this as their inspiration to play music. Tom Allum produced this one and would further produce on subsequent albums really showcasing the strengths of this band with rock sounds, metal shred, and even experimentation. This is a flawless Priest record. There's been anniversary editions released, like a 30th one and a 40th one where you get bonus tracks. And this album has gone platinum in the US, gold in the UK, Canada, and Sweden. And as far as vinyl goes, if you want to get like an original pressing, you should look to pay about $10 for a, a, maybe a fair to good copy and it just goes from there. <laughs> Blizzard of Oz is the first solo outing for Ozzy after being fired from Black Sabbath in 1979. You have Ozzy still going strong vocally along with the classic guitar wizardry by the late Randy Rhodes. This album has a lot of synth and classical guitar workings, but don't be deceived by that because there's plenty of heavy riffs and blistering solos. I Don't Know is such an awesome song with some really great lyrics. Personally. I never want to hear Crazy Train ever again, but that's only due to the constant playing in everything and on the radio every single day. It's a great song, but for God's sakes, there's other great songs on this album. Suicide Solution got Ozzy in hot water, having parents act as though Ozzy was advocating suicide. I mean, if you listen to the lyrics, you'll know that that isn't even the case at all. That being said though, the song is awesome. The album definitely has that post 70s sound with some really good analog synths throughout. Um, this album went on to eventually sell over 6 million albums, making it Ozzy's most successful to date. There's many special editions of this with many different bonus tracks, demos, um, just guitar and um, bass without vocals, different things like that. Uh, on CD, but if you're looking to pick up the vinyl, you're going to probably pay around anywhere from $10, 10 to 15 just as a starting point, and usually those are fair to good copies at best. Van Halen's third album, Women and Children First, jumps right into the heavy with And the Cradle Will Rock. It doesn't let up there with Everybody Wants Some, which also was featured in one of my favorite movies, Better Off Dead, and it's probably one of my favorite parts in the movie too. Eddie Van Halen's guitar work needs no introduction, but his stylings were definitely getting far heavier at this point. Romeo's Delight and Tora Tora really showcase that heavy sound. The drums, the bass, the lead and backing vocals together with the master of guitar make for one fantastic and relentless album. This could be my favorite Van Halen album next to their debut. There's no filler and all killer. 
killer riffs and blistering sonic leads that is the man delivers i'm biased for van halen but clearly the rest of the masses were too with this going triple platinum in the u.s double platinum in canada gold in france and gold in the netherlands also four of the nine tracks from van halen's guitar hero game are from this album i originally picked this one up at a garage sale for about 50 cents when i was 10 years old but nowadays you're probably going to spend around anywhere from like ten dollars and up for a used copy but you don't want to forget that nice little poster that comes with it iron maiden's self-titled debut mixes the speed and spirit of punk with the sonic prog sounds of the 70s it's an absolute classic. Steve Harris's driving bass, you have Clive Burr's drums, Dennis Stratton and Dave Murray's dueling guitars, with Paul Diano's vocals make for a different experience than the later Dickinson releases. The lower production just adds to the overall feel. There's punk speed mixed with melodic pickings and plenty of heavy riffs. Yet another pioneer of the NWO BHM movement, this is probably my favorite from it. The imagery just further rounds out this metal masterpiece. I feel without Bruce on this, it actually gives it a better feel than had he been on it. It truly is a standout piece of music from the heavy metal movement then, and eventually Maiden's own catalog. I found this LP in my dad's basement when I was a lot younger, and it was trashed. The sleeve was stuck to the record, it was just eaten away by different things like mold and water damage, but with some different procedures I used along with peroxide, dish soap, and plenty of brushes, I got to finally listen to what would become my favorite Maiden release. This went um, platinum in the UK and in Canada and gold in Germany. And there's been plenty of repressings of this, and you can get this in many different CD forms with bonus tracks. And if you're looking to pick up a record, you're going to be starting off in the $20 range. And at long last, we finish this list with the Godfathers of Metal, Black Sabbath. Tony Iommi, Geezer Butler, and Bill Ward recruit the singing and lyric talents of the legendary Ronnie James Dio. Hot take, folks. This is my favorite Black Sabbath album, for sure. This album really brought the band back to life. The band had to fund recording this themselves due to the label believing no one would want a non ozzy album. With Dio's vocals, the band experimented to complement them. Blues metal with psychedelic-styled solos, synths, and shredding speed make this feel like the band has been born again. Neon Knights, Heaven and Hell, Lady Evil, and Children of the Sea are just the tip of the iceberg for the sonic metal masterpiece. Dio's lyrics really bring a new dynamic to the band as well. Many Ozzy fans gave Dio a lot of grief live for some time, but eventually he won them over. This may not be considered the classic Sabbath album, but this one will not disappoint. You definitely want to pick this one up. It went gold in Canada, gold in the UK, and platinum in the US. Now this one's a little bit harder to find on vinyl. I don't know if it's because people really don't want to sell it. I haven't really seen many represses, but it goes from anywhere from around $30 to $50 just as starting points. But if you really love Sabbath and you gotta have that, it's about that much money to pick it up. Well that concludes the top 10 essential heavy metal records of 1980. I hope you guys enjoyed this list. And if you did, just hit subscribe and like and keep your eyes peeled because 1981 is just around the corner, along with some other types of 80 lists that I'll be doing in the near future. Also, what would a top 10 list be without an essential honorable mention list? <laughs>